And don't mind this. Uh, I've got like three mics going here, so perfect. And I do thank you for joining us here today. Uh, and just to properly introduce you, this is Graham Maloney with Red Wave America PAC, the Political Action Committee. And before we do anything else, I know you're a co-founder of that, but before we say anything else, let's start off with who is Graham Maloney? Well, I'm a longtime political activist. I grew up in a far left environment in California, and I got sick of it at a really young age. And I just completely uh, kind of rebelled against all of it. I've been working in the conservative movement for about 25 years. I was a radio talk show host for 15 years. I've made a lot of appearances on Fox News Channel, Hannity and Laura Ingram and O'Reilly when that was on. Uh, so I've been in the movement a long time. And the biggest thing we have going right now is something on Facebook called Stop the Scalpings. I know it has a weird name, um, but it is like an anti-censorship group made up of conservatives on Facebook. Um, and we have 100,000 members there. Uh, and so we'd love for your viewers to check it out at Stop the Scalpings on Facebook. And on uh, for Red Wave America, you just type in at Red Wave America and you find our group there. So we've got a lot of things going on on social media. And social media is one of the big avenues right now. Obviously, it's sweeping the nation, uh, podcasts. That's the next generation. So it sounds like you're reaching out to the younger generation to tell them, is it because of the move of socialism or is there another message or another idea? Well, we have to bring in younger people. We just have to. And we're up against kind of insurmountable odds because young people are being taught, I mean, in the schools that socialism is the answer. And socialism, you know, would have worked in Cuba and the Soviet Union if it had ever been properly implemented. You know, I mean, the, the lies that our children are being fed every single day are, are they're just breathtaking um, and and they're absurd. But so trying to counter that, I mean, we're at an enormous disadvantage. I mean, we really are. I mean, they have the institutions behind them and we're just trying to get in there with an argument anywhere we can. Well, that is important. And I know that you see the media overall, not even on so, especially on social media, but the media in general is taking such a favorable view of the socialism of the Ocasio Cortez, the Bernie Sanders, the appeal of free stuff. And I think that's one of the big issues that we have to address. And I hear that here in, here in many of the speakers talking about that. How do you, how does Red Wave America impact? How do you target that? How does your uh, online presence, how are you working to address it? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this part of political, political activism, the, the PAC, the fundraising, that aspect, out of Washington and into the mainstream grassroots of America. So conservatives all over the country, uh, instead of having people in Washington make these decisions who are party establishment types, who don't put the money in the right places, uh, we're trying to get out there, and our messages are different, too. Our messages are more ones that resonate with, we think, the average person. Because we just think that the swamp itself is very, very out of touch. Uh, so we're trying to do things differently with a fresh approach. We only launched Red Wave America last year and we kind of put our feet in the water with some races. We were active in Texas with some billboard cam uh, billboard campaign going against Beto O'Rourke. We were active in Florida. So we've just been doing... But this next election, uh, we're going to go full throttle here. We're going to go all the way. And so that's what we're gearing up because look, we can't afford to lose this election. And I know everybody says that every time. If we lose this one, I don't know when we ever get it back. I don't, I don't know that we do because the left has been so good at fundamentally changing the structure so that they win all the elections. I mean, look what they've done in California. Going door to door to collect your ballot, not on your door five days in a row until you give them your ballot, you know, collecting massive numbers of ballots, and then some person is dropping them off. We don't know what's going on with them. Um, so we have, you know, we have that kind of stuff going on. Um, how do we counter that? And our party, Republican Party, seems very, very little to, uh, to, to fight any. We're not seeing much from the party in response. We're seeing the usual asleep at the at the wheel kind of, of, of attitude they've had for years. So there's so many problems to overcome in such a short period of time. I don't, I mean, the odds are not really in our favor that well, that much. So, well, I can understand. There's a lot of criticism that can be made out there, absolutely. 
and uh, not many people are willing to say it. Right. So I, I do find that interesting. Let me ask you, in reference to okay, 19, 20, 20, where, what states are you looking to go towards to focus and what uh, particular issues specifically are you looking to tackle? Well, we have been very active on the immigration issue. But now the, the surprise issue is abortion. You know, I don't think we ever would have been in that in that realm at all. Um, I don't think that would have even been on our list. But the Democrats have put that issue back on the front burner and on the agenda through stupidity on their part. And if we do win the next election, it'll be largely because the Democrats just blew it. Um, I mean, the, the extremism we've seen from the Democrats so far in this congressional term has been just amazing to me. Uh, you know, the infighting that's going on. But the abortion issue, I think they were foolish. The Democrats were foolish to stir everyone up on abortion. I'm from New York State, uh, upstate New York, and I can tell you uh, how the backlash in New York State was immediate and in, it was impressive. How many people, both Republicans, conservatives, libertarians, and even some of the Democrats, were completely dumbfounded that they moved that uh, yeah. abortion to the late term, and we're hearing down the Carolinas how they're looking to even go post birth. I yeah, mean, how this can you believe that? At this point, it's just it's just un, un, impossible to imagine. But their real agenda is coming out now, and it's an even more extreme agenda than any of us knew, even those of us who follow the left every single day. It turned out they were even wackier than we knew they were, and we study them. And I, I just, you know, and, and to be from New York State, I mean, Andrew Cuomo, I mean, is, is a disgrace to the entire nation. I mean, how New York can stand, I don't care, if, even if you are a Democrat, how anyone can stand him. I mean, he is insufferable. He is everyone, impossible. Everyone knows he, well, there is a large consensus of thought that he's corrupt and just has avoided. I mean, everyone circling around him has been right. uh, pretty much convicted of right. that. So, we do, those are one of the intrinsic problems. And I just I focus on it because we see California, New York, they basically are the social test grounds. Right, right. And then we see it go from there out to the rest of the nation. Yeah. So in that regard, let me just ask you, uh, you mentioned immigration. And I do yeah, want to get to that. I sure. know you're from New York. You know, I, yeah, I'm from Massachusetts, actually, at this point. Yeah, oh, yeah okay. even worse. Was... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the funny thing is Massachusetts has a Republican governor. He's right. he's a liberal Republican, but I'd rather have a... a well, Somewhat, he's a moderate to liberal Republican. I'd rather have that than Andrew Cuomo any day of the week. I agree because, and a lot of conservatives would disagree with me. They'd say, "But you need a real conservative, but you're never going to get one in Massachusetts." You know, so if you got a moderate who holds the line on left wing extremism for four years or eight years, that's as good as you're going to get in a deep blue state. That's as good as it gets. You know, the deep blue states are the difficult ones. Yeah. That's what and you're right, Massachusetts is one of the fights that we definitely have to have. Yeah. Uh, and I do want, immigration takes a little time. So I want to, before I get to that, I want to talk about, are you familiar with the red flag legislation? Massive advocate for the Second Amendment. So I always like to bring this up, and I know it's something that is spreading throughout the nation. Right. And as I recall, Massachusetts did pass the red flag legislation before New York. New York just, just passed it. New York passed it early. Um, how have you felt about it? What, what is your thoughts? Um, I, you know, and I mean, it's not a state where you had a lot of rights to begin with, and it, it seems up to, in terms of the Second Amendment, it seems more up to the individual sheriffs in the counties. And now it's, it seems like it's been more of a regional kind of thing, depending on where in the state you live. And, you know, Massachusetts, it's funny, because you talk about New York, how different upstate is from New York City. It's the same thing in Massachusetts. I'm, I'm in Southeast Massachusetts, and it's really not that liberal there. Uh, it's 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 country music. It's pickup trucks. It's cranberry bogs. Um, it's not Harvard. It's not Cambridge. You know it, it, exactly. It couldn't be more different. Um, so, you know, even in New England, even in the Northeast, even in New York, you get outside the cities. And it still looks a lot like America. And that is an America where people want to have their Second Amendment rights, you know, where they want to be able to do this. And, you know, but you've got people in Boston and Albany who are going to do whatever they can to take away their rights as much as possible. So, I mean, that, that war continues. But in a state like Massachusetts, there's not much you can do 
because you don't have anyone you can really go to. There's not much of a Republican presence in uh, in the legislature. Just a few, just a handful. Especially now in New York, because right. it's a single party, uh, very liberal Democratic base. Yeah. Uh, which is incredible, and thus we get the abortion laws. Yeah, so at that point, all you're relying on are federal decisions, federal court decisions, the Supreme Court. You know, that's that's your only protection. You don't have it at the state level. And the only other protection I guess you have, like I said, would be the individual policies of the county sheriffs in, in the particular one that you live in. I know that for New York, a lot of the sheriffs have, uh, Western New York in particular, have come out and have been sanctuary areas for the Second Amendment and for a more conservative view, regardless of the governors and the legislation of the states coming out and saying, no, we have to take away the Second Amendment rights. Yeah. Has that been the experience that you've seen in Massachusetts? Uh, I, think, I think it's pretty similar. I think within the Northeast, it doesn't vary that much. So, yeah. And it's kind of, that's what I've heard, it's very consistent for most of the states. I think so. On the individual local level, as opposed to what we're hearing from uh, state legislators. Absolutely. And that's a disconnect. And that's yeah. a disconnect. And I think that needs to be addressed when we're brought up. Right. Uh, let me ask you, let's go to immigration. And let's talk, because that's one of the big things that your organization is working on. Uh, and looking at immigration, obviously we've seen a lot of emphasis on open borders, whether it's de facto uh, open borders because we're not building a wall or the fact that they're looking to just open up our Take down the walls, in fact. Exactly. Uh, take down the ones that are there. Beto O'Rourke, take down the walls that are already there. Yeah. Now that is, you know, that like abortion, it's like the left, the Democrats have come out with, they're pandering to their, their fringe extremes, and they've made that their mainstream viewpoint now. It's like, wait a second, I've never heard Democrats say before, tear down existing walls. That's new. So the fact that they're pandering to that extreme element they're handing us, like I said, if we win next year, it's going to be because they handed us everything by, by being wacko. Um, on, you know, because I think if they wanted to win an election next year, I think they would say we've already got protections on the border, leave it alone. But instead, it's tear down the walls, abolish ICE, abolish ICE detention centers, um, abolish the private companies that are running some of the private detention centers, um, a couple in particular. You know, remove them from the equation as well. And the fact is, they're doing a better job than the federal government can do any day of the week. So there's so many aspects of this. But I think that you know, if you were a moderate party trying to win, because there's that moderate, you know, there's that that independent group in the middle on any election that you need the suburban voters. Like the Democrats are ceding all of those potentially to us by taking these extreme positions. So they'll be as popular as ever on the college campus, but in the suburbs where people live, work and swing one way or the other, one party or the other, you're, you're kind of sabotaging yourself and you're making it easier for us. I hope so. I hope, oh, I hope, I hope so, so too. The, the bottom line about next year is that it, a lot of it depends on how popular Trump is next November. You know, and that is how... That's the honest, that's the honest viewpoint. If the economy's doing well, if we've got movement with North Korea where he's coming back, and the last report I heard was things were going very well with that. Right. Um, obviously, these things will help give us more momentum. They will. And, and conversely, if there's some horrible thing that's happened between now and then, it'll hurt us. But I think that they've immunized Trump on so many issues by just complaining too much, whining too much. And this kind of circus we had yesterday with, you know, with Michael Cohen, um, which doesn't help them at all. It just sounds, you know, you're ha- the He's whole lying. thing was He's well, convicted of lying. How right. You when, you know, when were you lying then or now? You know, that's like that's like uh, law school one on one right there. You know, so were you lying that day or are you lying today? You know, why should we trust you when you're already convicted of lying? Now you say you're telling the truth. I mean, it's it's just you're, Either way ever know. you're done. You're done. You know, I mean, that your your credibility's gone right there. So the whole thing was a it was a, a farce. It really was. Now, I, looking at the pack, and I do want to get back to the scalpel. I want to bring that up again. By the way, the, the website again is. So we have uh, so we have mediaequalizer.com is one of our sites. If you're on Facebook, check out Red Wave America. Just type in at Red Wave America, and you'll go to our page. 
And then the big group we have on Facebook is called Stop the Scalpings. One word, Stop the Scalpings. 100,000 members there. I was thinking scalp. Scalpings. I know it's a weird name. It, there's a reason for the weird name that goes back to our beginnings. Because um, people, the first thing people say is, why do you have a weird name like that? There's a good reason for it. Um, and that is just that the left has a habit, and this is their own terminology, of collecting conservative scalps. So they're trying to kick conservatives off the airwaves, you know, scalping conservatives. And they scalped Bill O'Reilly one day. They almost had Sean Hannity. Um, they've gone after Tucker Carlson. I mean, they've harassed him in his home with First, his family and children. Family, yeah. With the that. children. That was crazy. Yeah. So that's what we're dedicated to fighting back against. It stopped the scalpings. And that's why it has that funny name. It has a real purpose. And, uh, you know, and a name like that drives the left nuts. So, <laughs> a little bit of both. A bonus there. <laughs> Which is why our other group is called the Media Equality Project, because that drives the left nuts too, because that sounds like the kind of group they would have. So, it's just the kind of name they would use. So, it's always fun to poke them, you know, here and there uh, just for kicks, because they are, they are obnoxious. So. Uh, Brent, I know we're running out of time. We've got about uh, six minutes or so. Sure, okay. Uh, let me ask you, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the PAC yeah. uh, and ask about, obviously PACs were very much driven by how much money they were able to accumulate and redistribute to the various candidates. So let me ask you, how did you do, I know it was your first year, how did the PAC do in getting that? And how do you look uh, in the near term to be able to address more and more candidates? Well, what we're doing is another way we're swamp free is keeping overhead extremely low. Because when you give money to a PAC or a super PAC that's based in Washington, you're paying for the office rent for the suite they have on K Street or whatever. The rent is an, an enormous expense. They have an extremely high overhead. So very little money actually goes to the candidates. So we're running this on a shoestring and making sure as much money gets to the people as possible so that they can maximize, you know, uh, so that our ad buys on their behalf are maximized. That's the point. We're not, we're not actually giving money to candidates, but we're spending on their behalf independently without their knowledge or consultations or a super pass. Separate. I want to make that. Yeah, I don't want to be confusing about that because the law is very clear. I, I, and that's why I want to give you the opportunity right. to address yes. it because I know people well, you know what? It's easy to, yeah, it's incredibly complicated maneuvering all of it. Um, the FEC is not fun to deal with at all, and they would love to nail some conservative scalps. The, so, yeah, yeah, they would. They would. I mean, they, you know, the left still runs Washington. I mean, it isn't really changed that much. You know, there's not only so much Trump could do. You know, well, especially in such a short amount of time. Right. It's still yeah. in his first term. Yeah. I think a lot of people miss that we're still in the first term and look at so many things that are, if not done in motion, uh, that we've heard about for the last 20 years. Yeah, and he doesn't get that much help from the Republicans. He really doesn't on a lot of this stuff. The Republicans in Congress, they don't really stand by him when he's trying to clean house. I mean, they're usually they're protecting their friends or whatever. So we've got problems. You know, we need to deal with in a lot of places. How much, in terms of the Republican Party, as well as the Conservative Party, maybe even the Libertarian Party, how much are you getting resistance there? Are they embracing the efforts that you're doing? Uh, well, I think that they are entirely independent of our efforts, and I don't think they would be supportive because what we're doing is fundamentally turning away from their establishment and their leadership. I think the GOP absolutely needs new. Uh, fresh blood at the top. The same people have been running the show, same establishment figures. You know, now you have a Mitt Romney as senator. You know, it's like that's that's his crowd. You know, that that's his crowd that runs the He's RNC. Yeah, and that's and those people are never about making our lives better. You know, that crowd is always about protecting themselves and their own interests. And, you know, so the grassroots conservative Republican out there isn't really being represented except maybe by uh, certain representatives, you know, members of Congress here and there, but not by the party leadership at all. So fundamentally, what we have to do over time is change that, because if we don't even have our own side figured out, how, how can we ever expect to beat them? That's true. That's true. We always have to have our house in order right. to be able to bring that order to others. I right. I agree with that. Uh, let me ask you, and I know we're just about done, but I do want to get this. If you could pick, 
obviously you believe in term limits. I, from what I'm hearing from what you're saying, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. Um, would you say you support the term limits? Well, I, I'm thinking more of the party leaders themselves, the people running the party. Um, I don't know if term limits is the answer. It might be in terms of elected representatives, maybe. Um, it's something worth considering. But ultimately, you know, it's about cleaning house at the RNC. Um, but it's also about getting, I think people like, you know, McConnell probably need to move on. I mean, I'm not completely against him, but I, I don't I don't know that he's the right person anymore in the Senate. Um, I think we need a fresh face there. Um, you know, we got rid of some of the people we had in the House, but unfortunately we lost the House on top of it, so that didn't really do us any good. But getting rid of Paul Ryan, in my view, was, was a fabulous thing, because I think that he was in the way of us ever getting anything done. And that's why the wall wasn't funded in the first two years of the Trump presidency when Republicans had control of everything. Why did not any of that stuff happen? Paul Ryan, you know? I mean, Paul was there to stop things from happening. So, you know, with friends like that, who needs enemies? So I've got about a minute. Sure. And I, I want to finish up. Let me ask, uh, are there any races, uh, any states that people should look for to see new organizations moving on? Are there any events that you would say next month or two someone can look for and be able to turn? Well, we're not quite at that point yet, but okay. we're definitely going to be looking at the major swing states. I hope we're not in a position where we have to try to hang on to red states like Texas again, because that was not a fun place to be. So we're still formulating that, but there are two special elections coming up in North Carolina for two House seats. And so we would like to be involved in those because um, those are two special circumstances. But so we see North Carolina coming up as, as we really need those two seats. So um, so we'll definitely be getting involved with that. And so we'll definitely look to see how that goes and what your involvement is. We'll be able to contact you, obviously, with your concerns. Uh, and I'll be posting that as well. But I want to thank you for the time today to be able to introduce yourself and let us know about your organizations. I thank you for the conversation. Really thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay.